Good afternoon. Welcome to meeting 109 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Accounts. It's in a hybrid format, pursuant to the standing orders. Members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application, including today's witness. A reminder that all comments should be addressed to the chair. Confirmant l'article 183 du règlement. Pursuant to Standing Order 1083G, the committee is resuming its study of Report 1, Arrive Can, referred to committee on Monday, February the 12th, 2024. Welcome our witness, David Yo, business owner, who's joining us, as I said, by video conference. Mr. Yo, I appreciate you making yourself uh, available to us today. And uh, as discussed with the clerk, you have uh, an, opening or an, an opening statement of up to five minutes, please. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to you if you'd like to uh, uh, speak to us for up to five minutes. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I hope everybody can hear me fine. Yes, we can. I would, li I would like to start off by saying uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and honourable members of the committee. Um, this land that we gather on today is a traditional ancestral and ceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation and is now home to many other First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. I'm a descendant of treaty signing chief Robert Franklin, who is my great grandfather and has passed and passed chief of Alderville First Nation. He was also a World War I veteran. I hold Elderville First Nations community near and dear to my heart as this what forms my indigenous ancestry. I have family that live there and my father is also buried there next to my great grandfather. I too am an indigenous veteran I, who served with the Canadian Army for 14 years from 1987 to 2001. Following this, I joined the Canadian Armed Forces Reserves for another 10 years from 2001 to 2011. From, from September 1991 to 19, February of 1992, I was deployed to Cyprus as a part of a UN mission with the 2nd Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment. I was a C9 machine gunner and driver along the front lines for six months. From August to November 2010, I was deployed in Afghanistan as a contractor for the Department of National Defense to deliver a high assurance security capability to Kandahar. We also went outside the wire to all of the Ford operating bases as well. I received a commander's commendation for my contribution to Task Force Kandahar. I'm a tactical security specialist with expertise and certifications in high assurance guarding technologies for the Canadian Armed Forces, both on mobile platforms and security areas within the CAF or specialty areas within the CAF. In 2002, I founded Dalian Enterprises, a hardware software cybersecurity company, and the Government of Canada is Dalian's primary customer. In 2002 until September of 2023, I was not an employee of the Canadian government in any capacity, uh, but a contractor providing IT professional services through Dalian to the Department of National Defense. Since 2002, Dalian has been regularly audited by Indigenous Services Canada to confirm compliance with all requirements with the, with the procurement strategy for Indigenous business. And the company has passed every one of them, including one just recently in February 2024. The PSIB is designed to help Indigenous entrepreneurs like me start and grow a business by providing them access to procurement opportunities within the Government of Canada, either directly or through partnership. The PSIB has been successful in helping many Indigenous owned companies, including Dalian, to launch, grow, and prosper. In late September 2023, long after the completion of all work on ArriveCan by Dalian, my professional relationship changed with the Department of National, uh, National Defense. It changed from that of a consultant providing IT professional security services to a public service employee with the PIPSI Union. That happened on the 19th of September, 2023. So I'll say that again, 19th of September, 2023. Due to this change, I took steps to address any conflict of interest concerns by entering into a confidentiality, non-disclosure, no access agreement with Dalian, in which I agreed to refrain from participating in any Dalian proposals, projects, contracts, ventures, or any other activity relating directly or indirectly to the National Defense Department. Since becoming a public service employee of National Defense, I have honored that agreement, have not been involved in any management of uh, our operations at Dalian, and have not had access to Dalian confidential information of any kind. 
I also made appropriate conflict of interest filings with the National Defense Department, resigned as director and officer of Dalian, and put my Dalian shares into a blind trust. Unfortunately, no one from the media ever contacted Dalian before I, before, or Dalian or I, before publishing reports late in February. They suggested that I was a public service employee for decades. This resulted in an unfounded allegation at DND and uh, un unfounded allegation at DND that I was in conflict of interest. I understand that DND has now made a statement that there was no conflict of interest, but I have already made the choice and resigned from the public service after just 168 days, mostly due to all of this um, a very um, difficult situation. So even more disappointingly, no one from the federal government uh, has ever contacted Dalian or myself before undertaking the unprofound action of terminating all contracts with Dalian, hardware and software and professional services, suspending security clearances, suspending Dalian and Craddocks from continuing wor uh, current work and competing for future opportunities with the government of Canada, their primary customer for 22 years and 29 years respectively. This all happened within 48 hours within, without due diligence or in our concept, due process. Um, there's not been a single review, investigation or audit report or study that has indicated Dalian or did anything wrong or illegal during the Arrive Can or the Arrive Can project or any other government project that we've been involved with. Despite this, and as a result of these unfounded terminations and suspensions, hundreds of employees and consultants are already out of work or soon will be from both companies. Neither company has done nothing wrong or different for the past two and three decades of working with the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. That went to a little over time. People might recognize, but I did want to give you an opportunity to just get, your, that. to get your words on the on the record. Uh, turning out to our first round, we have Mr. Barrett. You have the floor for six minutes, please. On what date did you start your employment with the Government of Canada? Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, Government of Canada uh, start date was the 19th of September, 2023. Okay, I'll circle back to that. On what date were you first employed uh, in any capacity with the Government of Canada, including in the Canadian Armed Forces? Uh, that would be uh, start date of September, or sorry, December 17th, 1987. Have you been employed by any other departments other than as a regular reserve member of the Canadian Armed Forces and the Department of National Defence? Uh, so the short answer is no, but I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about my consulting work. Uh, we'll get to we'll get to that. Um, okay. You mentioned the date of September 19, 2023. That was the date that you said what happened? That was the date that I started as a public service employee. And did anything else happen on that date that's noteworthy for the work of this committee? Um, not that I'm aware of. No. So uh, um, we have uh, in the documents that the committee has received, it says that, um, that, that the department signed a contract with you on that very same date. So um, I find that interesting uh, that on September 19th of 2023, you were both awarded a contract and awarded a job in, in the public service. Does Dalian have contracts that are current with the government of Canada? Uh, not currently, no, because they were all terminated. So the, so the number is zero? Number is zero. Uh, are you able to, is Dalian able to fully do business with the Government of Canada or bid on work? Uh, no, we are not. Uh, we have been suspended from all security clearances, uh, obviously pending this uh, discussion and, and other discussions ongoing. Uh, but, and all of our contracts have been terminated. So... By virtue of that, uh, there is no ability to execute. Yeah. How many subcontractors do you have? That is a really good question. Um, from a professional services standpoint, I would actually have to get back to you on that. From a hardware and software perspective, uh, we have four or five that we use. Yeah. Sir, if you're going to get back to us with the number, can you also provide the committee with the names of those subcontractors? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you'd note that for, for us, please, Chair. Um, Noted. Was GC Strategies ever a subcontractor of Dalian? Uh, again, you know, I, I spend, um, you know, a large portion of my time or I spent a large portion of my time with the Defense Department. 
uh, whether it was my 168 days as a uh, public servant or whether it was, you know, my consulting time at the department. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, uh, the obvious answer is yes, but the the aspect of, of them, you know, working with us, um, I'd have to get more detail for you. Yep. So you can provide us with the, um, with the, the when and on which contracts? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we know, of course, that they, they were, and I, I appreciate yeah. you uh, indicating a, uh, even a tertiary awareness of it, um, but uh, they were caught uh, not following security requirements for government contracts. For all of your contracts with the government, knowing that GC Strategies did not meet security requirements, are you able to guarantee the security of all of the contracted work done that you have done with the Government of Canada? Uh, again, the short answer would be yes, because we are, you know, ISO certified in our processes. Uh, but a large part of this happens to be with our, as a prime contractor with the federal government, whether it's, um, you know, an Aboriginal set-aside contract or not, uh, because we've, we've had both in the past. Um, but I would say that, you know, in retrospect to that, uh, if they have some kind of misgivings on their security clearances, um, you know, that, that would be tracked through and, and we should be, we should have awareness of that at our own security shop. So I've never been told of any, you know, issues with the security clearance uh, side of things with GC. And again, I've just been, you know, read into this file over the last number of months and it, it hasn't uh, come up as an issue. So are, are you aware of uh, the reports that I'm referring to that GC strategies, um, uh, did not follow the security requirements for contracts with the government of Canada. Is that is that something that you've been aware of prior to my speaking of it with you just now? No, 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 it isn't. Uh, you know, I, it, you'd have to give me more details on the actual security requirements uh, that were actually you know not followed, uh, because I'm not aware of any that they didn't. Have you or your uh, partner at Dalian ever provided any hospitality to any government of Canada employees? Not that I'm aware of, no. Have I've you or your haven't. partner at Dalian ever met with government employees outside of government offices? I know I have not. And I can say that this is not something that is uh, even remotely uh, looked at from, you know, an internal perspective. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, no. Did you ever meet with um, Christian Firth of GC Strategies? I have not met Christian once. No. Have you ever spoken to him? No. Have you ever spoken to his partner? No. Has your partner ever spoken to Mr. Uh, Firth or his partner? I, I would assume yes to that question. Okay. Because obviously there was a subcontract that was put together for CBSA for this effort. Uh, so I would imagine that there would have been dialogue that would have had to have happened. Yeah. Is Dalian registered anywhere outside of Canada? Uh, no. Okay, my last question is, you stated previously that you are constantly audited to ensure that you're eligible for the Indigenous set-aside when winning bids as a joint venture with Karatix. Who is conducting these audits, and when was the last audit done? Sure. Um, so the audits are done by ISC, which is Indi Indi Indigenous Services Canada, and uh, the last one that was done was done in February 2024, just a few, months, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Chen. You have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Yo, uh, my first question to you is how many years uh, has Dalian been working on federal contracts? So, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate the question. I started the company in 2001, 2002, and we won our first contract within the first year, so shortly after that. And could you describe the nature of your contributions to the Arrive Can application? So again, you know, I'm, I'm very much uh, two gates deep at D&D &D, uh, in what I do or what I did uh, at the department um, before, before uh, I had to resign after 168 days. But the, the upshot is, is that um, when it comes to Arrive Can, and I, I've been read into the file now uh, and have been for a while, the aspect of uh, revenue, from what I understand, is 4.9 million, and that's basically 1.6 million per year for the three years that uh, that the contracts were open, um, which is is what I understand that went through a, a staff augmentation contract, 
uh, at uh, CBSA, so it wasn't actually an ArriveCan Arrive -can app. It was a, um, a, a directorate or a, uh, a department level uh, standing offer through TBIPS or through, in this case, BADSI. And, uh, and so that, that's uh, the staff augmentation uh, contract that was used to facilitate this, uh, from my understanding. And it was 20 contractors uh, for three years for approximately 100 days per year, which is basically part time. Thank you. Could you describe um, your relationship, if any, with GC Strategies and also Coradix? Sure. Um, I don't have a personal relationship or, or professional relationship with GC. I mean, they, uh, from my understanding, again, getting right into the file, um, they were, you know, a part of um, uh, communication from CBSA that, that there was a task authorization coming that needed to be fulfilled. Uh, through GC and and as the prime contractor and, and as a general contractor for that contract, uh, we facilitated that. Um, so you know that's that's basically my uh, interaction with GC, which is nil. I, I've never spoke to any of the principals, and and again I've just been uh, read into the file, and this is what I know. Um, as far as Cradix is concerned, it's a much different relationship. I've been, you know, with them since 2001, 2002. When I first started this company, you know, from Barhaven uh, on my kitchen table and, and going after, you know, the first Indigenous contract that I, I was awarded uh, in the first year with the RCMP and, and Bell, uh, Bell Canada. And it was to provide hardware, hardware into uh, the RCMP. Um, you know, obviously being, you know, one guy and, and, and trying to start a business, I, I partnered up with Karatex because uh, I, I know some people and, uh, and we've had a very good relationship since then. It's been a um, kind of a shared services model between two companies. Uh, they do, you know, much different work than we do at, uh, at Dalian as far as security is concerned. Uh, so it, it seemed like a good fit and um, yeah, and, and so it's been a, a 22, 23 year uh, relationship with Karatex, yeah. I'd like to hear, in your view, uh, what is the timeline of the events? We've been talking about various dates uh, already in this meeting. Uh, what is the timeline of, of events that has led us to this point? Timeline of events. So I, I got to start back again. I'm, I'm buried two gates deep doing high assurance security, trying to get it out to our warfighters. So getting right into this file was probably my first shot back in October of this year, realistically, um, you know, when we got the notification that we needed to go and talk to Ogo. Um, so, you know, from a timeline perspective, uh, that's kind of where I sit from getting read into the file. But after I did, uh, you know, gain some knowledge on it, um, my understanding that this goes back to 2019. Um, you know, we have a, a, a very good contract or had a very good contract with CBSA, a staff augmentation contract through a BASD. And, uh, and, and we were doing some good things over there and, and that the intent for CBSA was actually to bring over 25% of their uh, server uh, applications from CBSA on-prem to AWS cloud. And so I think that that's kind of where it started in 2019. And then um, obviously, you know, into the early 2020s, um, we had this whole COVID outbreak thing happen. and. And all of this uh, craziness that happened with, um, you know, the ramp up to uh, getting a Rive can, you know, out the door. And, um, and so, you know, we were a small part of that. We were 4.9 million of that, 1.6 million a year, 20 contracts part time. So, you know, from that perspective, um, that's kind of where I think it started. And then where it finished is, was, was May 2023, I think, from what I understand. And, uh, and that was certainly, you know, well before I started with the public service. Have you spoken to the RCMP on anything to do with government contracting? Yeah, no. No, the RCMP uh, has not been in contact with me at all. No. Have you spoken to anyone else on this uh, issue, uh, so, uh, anyone else who's been looking into the matter, for example, the Auditor General? Uh, no, I have no, had no interaction with the Auditor General at all, other than I know that our staff uh, noticed the discrepancies within, you know, the, the Auditor General's report. And, uh, and we're not they notified the Auditor General on the 30th of January uh, this year uh, of the discrepancy that it wasn't 7.9, it was 4.9, uh, but that never made it into the report. You mentioned discrepancies in the report. You just mentioned one of them. Are there any other discrepancies that, that your staff or yourself have noted in the report that you brought to the attention or plan to bring to the attention of the Auditor General? Yeah, sure. Um, 
you know, as it sits right now, you know, I, I have read the report. I mean, I'm, I'm a certified contracts and procurement specialist. That's what I did for my first hundred and some odd days with D&D. And, uh, and I've been around contracting forever, so I, I understand it completely. Um, and, and what I can say, you know, out of the gate is that um, when I read through the audit, Auditor General's report, it's a good report, but um, it has vagaries and discrepancies in it, right? And, and there's in, incorrect information in it. And, and one of those incorrect areas is, is in our revenue stream. Um, 7.9 is not 4.9, 4.9 is not 7.9, it's $3 million difference and it's 60% uh, delta. So I mean, from that concept, um, you know, right there, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a different uh, aspect. The other side of it is that in key facts and findings, you know, you, you've got uh, a paragraph in there that says we found 18% of invoices submitted by the contractors that we tested did not provide enough information to determine whether the expenses related to the arrive can, uh, actually the expenses actually related to arrive can or another IT project. But, you know, I, I have a, a good number of um, notes on this and, and I've gone through the entire thing and, you know, I've got lots of questions and things like that, so. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chen, that is your time. You have the floor for six minutes. Thank you, Chair. First of all, uh, Mr. Yu, could you tell us how many employees Dalian has had since 2008? I tried to understand a bit of that, but um, unfortunately there was no interpreter in my ear. So uh, apparently there's there's a there's a a globe on the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, it will probably give you. Uh, globe. And we'll add it to that. May I ask you to recommence? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Will I be able to take my time again? Yes. I do. Yeah, absolutely. And what? what? Okay. Oh, so if you click on that, you might get various options. He makes ads. It's a globe. I think he did. Yeah, it's a little globe. Okay. okay. I think he's got it. Okay, so I've got it on French right now, so if you want to try it again. You might hear me in French. Um, um, alors, est-ce que vous, vous m'entendez <laughs> en anglais? Are you hearing me in English or in French now? Are, is it working? Right now. Do you hear me in English? So you, you heard what I said in English? I did. Très bien, okay. Uh, Very well then. So again, six minutes again, starting again from the top, like they say in Hollywood. Go ahead, Ms. Degonier. Starting again. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Yeo. First quick question. How many employees has Dalian had since 2008, please? 2008, okay. So uh, we had, uh, I believe, up to seven or eight full-time employees during the 20, uh, 2008 to 2012, 2013 timeframe. And the reason behind that, uh, well, obviously we were growing. Um, that was a good time for us. Uh, but SSC had come in during the 2012-2013 timeframe, and uh, and it changed a lot of our ability to execute with the government. And so there was a lot of downsizing after that, and a lot of consolidation. Um, so we've now you know moved down, uh, as a matter of fact, down to you know two full-time employees. But where this kind of gets uh, off the rails is that um, because we have a partnership with Caradix, right, we have a kind of a shared services model. And so, you know, we, we, were, shared, we were doing shared services before shared services became a thing. Okay. So, um, merci. Yep. Merci, merci, Monsieur Yon. Um, Thank you. Uh, the chronology provided by the Department of National Defense said that you began your employment on September the 19th, 2023. A contract was signed on that same date, September the 19th, 2023, by you. No, excuse me. It was signed on t September 28th, 2023, nine days later. Only nine days later, you signed a contract, whereas you were in the full-time employment of the Department of National Defense. Mr. Yeo, when you began your employment, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that public servants must follow the code of ethics and values of the public sector, and it's extremely clear in that code of uh, public sector values and ethics, you must declare any appearance of conflict of interest to a, to a line supervisor. Did you do so on September the 29th, 2023? Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So in, in retrospect to that, um, and again, you know, being uh, buried two gates deep in D&D &D and what I do with high assured security there, um, you know, and, and also on the 19th and even prior to that, 
you know, starting to devolve myself from the company. You know, I gave the ability for, as, as I was moving through the aspect of divesture, my lawyers and everything else, it took some time, I will agree. And, and that timing is, you know, not charitable to, uh, to your timeline of, of being only a few days. But the uh, short answer is, um, no, I did not inform anyone at the department that I signed anything. But then again, I did not actually sign it. I had a, a signature available for the staff at the office for them to use. Monsieur, the monsieur, vous savez très bien qu'en cours, une signature a un effet juridique. Sir, you know very well that in court, your signature will have legal value. If somebody places your signature on a contract, you're the one who's responsible. I hope you're aware of this because you're responsible for the contract, which is a number, well, I don't have the number in front of me, but it was signed on September the 29th. Your signature appears, so you are responsible. You did not inform your uh, hierarchical supervisor. That's at least on, regarding one very strong appearance of conflict of interest. The newspapers have told us, and according to public accounts, Dalian received roughly $150 million worth since, uh, since, uh, of contracts since uh, 2008. I understand they're subcontractors, but for a company that had a maximum of 10 employees, that's a lot of money. Why accept a position at Department of National Defense paying under $100,000 when your two-person company was making $150 million in just a few years? No, that's a good question, and, and I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, we had some great uh, great years during 2008 and the realm up to uh, shared services. Um, we had some pretty lean years between 2013 and, and now, basically, from a hardware software perspective, for sure. Um, but, you know, my, my reasoning for getting back into the department uh, was not based on money. You know, I, I've done 36 years with the department in varying capacities, whether it's regular force, whether it's reserves, whether it's my contracting time and my 168 days, you know, as a civil servant. Um, but I got back in primarily to drive capability and high assurance, you know, guarding solutions to the war fighters that are in harm's way out in the eastern flank of NATO. So that was my job there. That was my my claim to what I do at the department. And because I was there for so long, I understood and I was at the pinnacle of my technical abilities. So it made sense for me to get in and drive technology down to the warfighters that needed it the most. And that's primarily the reason, because I didn't do it for the money. Mais pendant ce temps-là, il y avait quand même un compte. But during that time, there was a signed contract by Dalian with your signature on it, granted by the Department of National Defense to carry out work. How many hours did you spend and how many hours did Dalian uh, spend on that last contract that I mentioned signed on September 20, 2023? What did Dalian do for that? So again, you know, I, I just got read into that part of it just recently because it was a very small contract. I think it was $40,000 $40, or maybe $49,000 from what I'm aware of. Um, but it, it, was, it was attached to a hardware sale. C'est le salaire that annuel was... moyen d'un Québécois. That's the average annual salary of a Quebecer, $49,000 a year. So a, 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 little, a small contract, well, I would perhaps use different terms. It, it, it's, yeah, but 90% of it or 75 or 80% of it goes back to the, the actual uh, consultant doing the work. But um, to answer your question, though, you know, there is precedence for uh, how you handle conflict of interest within a 60-day period or at windows of, of that time frame. And I did put in a no access, no contact, uh, no, no non-disclosure uh, with Dalian within that 60-day period. I actually signed that on the 10th of November um, 2023, which was in within the 60-day window. Uh, after that, we were working with lawyers and getting our stuff together as far as forms and everything was concerned. Uh, getting my divesture done and that sort of stuff um, during the time frame. And that has already been submitted to D&D &D as well. But uh, due to the hype and everything else around this particular uh, Arrive Can app, I uh, ended up having to put in my resignation because I was still on probation uh, because I was only there for 668 days. So. Voilà. Une petite question, ça va? Non, ça va. Okay, that's fine. Next. Visually, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the witness for being with us today on what is a very important topic. I, my colleagues asked some questions, but I'll have you reiterate some of the responses you had clearly in relation to the origin of your company. When did your company start under the name Dalian? Well, I started it myself uh, in 2001-2002. I, I don't have the exact date on me, but um, there's uh, documents that uh, that stood up the company at that time frame, uh, and I, I named the company myself. Yeah. 
And when did you begin bidding on government contracts? Uh, shortly thereafter. So it was uh, very shortly thereafter. Uh, I, I was actually talking with uh, Terry Matthews uh, here in town at a, at a breakfast meeting, and he had mentioned to me that uh, I should go after Indigenous business because that was something he was aware of. So at that point, I looked into it, and I found an Indigenous contract that I could go after, and I won it within the first year that I started the company. And how large was your company then, and how large is it now? Uh, well, it was only one person there because it was from my, you know, my, my uh, dining room table in Barhaven. Um, but uh, we have grown. We, we, it's grown up in 2008 to 2010, 2012. And then, you know, we've obviously contracted a lot because our hardware, bu uh, hardware business is all but dried up. And, uh, and we still do some professional services. And so how much total money in public contracts has your company received? Total. Um, so I know that from 2015 until now, it's uh, about 100,000, or uh, sorry, um, I, I just want to get this number correct, so please bear with me. Uh, yeah, from 2015 until now, we've got 91 million in contracts on, T, on TBIPs, basically, the professional services contracts. Yeah. And what did you? Do, what is it exactly that your company does? Um, so we're a hardware and software company, as well as a professional services security company. So basically, you know, we go after government contracts as a general contractor. Uh, when it comes to our professional services, we hire our, um, our our contractors through either you know subcontracting or potentially a JV with another company. How many um, subcontractors does your company operate? Given you know particular contracts on average it, it, on average not many we usually do them ourselves right uh, especially well, how many subcontractors do you operate right now again that's a great, great question i don't have that off the top of my tongue so i'll have to go back to the shop and ask them yeah it'd be great if you can uh, supply that list as well For and sure. yep. now you. i do want to turn attention to statements that were made by a firm known as botler their chief executive uh uh, named Dutt, uh, told MPs in another committee that she feared Dalian's procurement policies were, quote, another example of monetization and theft using the trauma of marginalized communities, end quote. Why do you think she said that? <laughs> well, I've got my own opinions. There's no question about that, but I'm not sure I can say them here. Um, you know, it's, it's really uh, an unrational statement, to be honest with you. I've been operating for 22 years with the government with, you know, top secret clearances and top secret facility clearances. Uh, we, we are not a bricks and mortars, uh, you know, uh, company. Uh, I have a, a, an office on the seventh floor at 222 Somerset downtown. Uh, and Karatex is down on the fifth. And, uh, and what I believe is that, uh, you know, Bottler, for, for what they've brought to this, uh, you know, situation, is that they were hired for, you know, four or five, um, you know, deliverables. They got through two of them, and CBSA canceled their task authorization due to whatever reasons they do. And so we got that cancellation uh, of the task authorization. We passed it on to GC. It floated down to Bottler, and, and they've been, um, you know, uh, not necessarily the kindest to Dalian since. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and then the costing of this is, is you know, small in retrospect to the uh, Arrive Can application project. So Bottler made clear that they were not certain that your firm or other firms, in particular GC Strategies, was aware. They were not aware, they claim, that there were that many subcontractors, including Dalian. When did you become aware that there were sub subcontractors like Bottler engaged in the same project you were? Yeah. Again, you know, I, I'm, I'm two gates deep in Dal in uh, D&D &D, uh, on, a, on a pretty much a daily basis, helping them over there, getting uh, the right capabilities in the right hands of the warfighters. Uh, so I, I, I got right into this as quickly as I could in, in the fall. And uh, especially when Bottler was, uh, you know, making the waves they were, which I think was uh, inappropriate. Um, but no, I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, with Bottler, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate that they took that tact. So I don't know what, if I answered your question, so I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. So if I, if I didn't answer your question, ask it again, please. No, no, sure. I'll, I'll ask it in a different way. The issues that were brought forward by Bottler include layers of subcontracting that hide okay. key details about who is getting paid for what, the cozy okay. ties between private staffing firms and, of course, those public servants uh, that ultimately influenced that decision. 
please comment directly on your knowledge related to the subcontracting and whether or not in your mind key details about who was getting paid for what was clear. Yeah. Yeah, again, I think that subcontracting happens all the time. I mean, we, we are the prime contractor on a lot of contracts, and then we sub out a lot of our work to other subcontractors, uh, and it happens in every industry. It, it doesn't matter whether it's... But in the government, it's, the government's a very particular... It's just public money. It's very yeah. important yeah, that we sure. understand that we have the most, the utmost uh, attention to the integrity of our public service. So, again... Do you believe that there were key details being hidden by way of layers, multiple layers of subcontracting? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that, no. And so oh, I'll leave my longer question. You've got a small one, go, go for it. If you have a small, if you have a quick question, go for it. Well, may, I'll just preface it. In then my next round of questions, I'll speak to you directly on this point as to the, your knowledge on subcontracting, how many other sure. subcontractors there were, and the numbers associated with those subcontracts, as well as the tasks authorization uh, process as well. Thank you, Mr. Desjardins. Uh, Today, opening our second round, uh, Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair, and, and good afternoon, Mr. Yo. <clears throat> I understand uh, from, uh, from earlier testimony, you became a public servant with DND on September the 19th of 2023, and you last testified before a committee on October 31st, 2023, approximately a month and a half uh, after you secured full-time employment as a public servant. So the question I put to you is, and I've read the transcript of your previous testimony, sir, at no point in time, despite being asked several questions about the nature of your employment, you focused squarely on your directorship and your shares within Dalian, and you said absolutely nothing about the fact that you were a public servant. So it begs the question, why would you withhold that information from Canadians? Yep, yep. Appreciate the question. Um, so this is needs to be analyzed a little bit more. And it was September 19th that I joined the uh, public service. It was 42 days later that the meeting, you know, came to us and we were invited as uh, Dalian. I was invited to uh, come to you and speak at uh, Ogo as Dalian. Um, the understanding is that Dalian holds a top secret facility clearance. And those that know what a top secret facility clearance is knows. And, and I hold a higher and did hold a higher than top secret security clearance for Dalian. As well, in my short time of 42 uh, days with the department, I also have a top secret clearance there and a secret clearance. So, you know, by nature of that uh, aspect and, and the fact that this had zero to do with D&D, &D, it had zero to do with, you know, what I do during the day as a high assurance specialist for the department, it has zero to do with my employment there, as well as the fact that... Okay, sir, I'm going to stop you there because a, my time... Sir, I'm going to stop you there. My sure. time is limited. I don't accept uh, your response, and I think most Canadians don't accept that response. After a month and a half, you were divesting your interests in Dalian. You had resigned as a director. You put all of your interest in a blind trust... And you were working on a full-time basis with DND, correct? You had no interest in Dalian, yet you gave the impression that you were still an active participant in this two-person company. So, sir, I, with, with, with respect, I completely disagree with, with your word salad of an explanation because it just doesn't add up. Now, I'm going to move on to a monetary aspect. You confirmed to my NDP colleague that you received $91 million in federal contracts since Justin Trudeau essentially took over government in 2015. What is your commission rate of that $91 million? So as a business, uh, as a business from Dalian's perspective, and these were TBIPs, professional services contracts. Sir, just okay. the commission rate, please. Sure, sure, but I need to preface that to make sure that... No, you, no, know, you don't. I'm asking for a number, sir, or a range. Yeah. What is your sure. commission? Most of the time, it ranges between 12 and 20 percent, and in this case, for the Arrive Can aspect, okay, that 91 million wasn't Arrive Can, by the way, but for the Arrive Can aspect, it was 18.2 from what my staff told me. 18.2 percent for Arrive Can, and yeah. you said you disagree with the AG's report 
that you uh, only receive four point nine million. One point six million a year. Yes. OK, so your 18.2 percent of four point nine. I can't do the quick math. Was that shared between you and your partner? Yeah, no, so you have to understand that. Sir, profit, sir, right? was it shared between you and your partner? Is it a 50 50 share operation with your other partner? It's it's a gross profit. And when it gets to be a gross profit, you have to you have to factor in expenses, employees, wages, commissions. I understand that, um, sir. The, were you sharing? The end in, it, sure. Were you sharing yeah. in the profits 50 50? So the no, not 50 50. I'm a majority shareholder in Dalian. OK, so what so what was your share of the four point nine million dollars? Well, it's not four point nine million dollars, though. It's it's revenue. That's four point nine million dollars in revenue. OK, let's not it's play different. games. What did you take home? What was your commission for arrive can? Give me a number, please. The, there, there is no number because why not? When you because when you own a business, and you have multiple. You have to declare this as income, sir. So why sure, why would you not have this number? You're going to provide but it, but this committee, sir. You're going to provide this committee within seven days your actual remuneration or bonuses on the Arrive Can app. Okay, within seven days. If we get asked to do that, sir, we will absolutely provide it. It's not an issue. And then over and above that four point nine million, I want to know. You're out of time, but I just, I just, uh, you've asked for some some documents. I just want to in, ensure that I, uh, Mr. Yo, is that you? You received a request from a member to provide um, some financial documents. Is that something you're prepared to do? Um, is that something you can do um, within uh, within a reasonable uh, amount of time? I say that because often often witnesses will agree to provide information that is requested by the committee. Um, uh, I, th I think you said if you're if you are asked by the committee, you would do so. Uh, we can formally do that, but we tried to avoid that. Is that the information sure. that Mr. Brock asked uh, you to provide? Is that something you you could you could do? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I am willing to support the committee on anything and everything that you know you guys need to be able to uh, get to where you need to go. Uh, so you. if there's a request for, okay. you know, what kind of remuneration would have come out of 4.9 million okay. uh, in a right can, then we, we'll pro we will provide that. Okay. Sure. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, yeah. I also, Mr. Brock mentioned seven days. I'm a little more generous. You have a couple weeks to get that before you begin to get some calls from uh, my assistance on this committee. But I just, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate I the clarity assure, on that. I can, assure, I, I, can, I can assure you we'll get back. I, I, I believe you will. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brock, that is your time. Moving now to Ms. Yip. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Yo. Could I also ask that when you send in the documents for that, that uh, you also include your commission on a contract between D and D and Dalian in 2013? D and D and Dalian in 2013. Okay. Uh, could um, I ask for a few more details about that? That's somewhat vague. Yeah. Um, like I'm not sure which contract you're you're talking about back then, ten years ago. TRN Technologies. TRM Technologies. Okay. Oh, that, you must be talking about my consulting. Yes. Is that is that is that what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just, just let yeah, me. I'll just pause asking. the clock. Is is that is that clear, Mr. Mr. Yao? Well, I think it's clear. I, I think she's asking for um, my consulting contract from TRM back in 2013. Does that make sense? Yes. That is it. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Clock rolling again. Thanks, Ms. Yip. Okay. Thank you. Uh, was Dalian on your resume when you applied to D&D? &D? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, and as a matter of fact, just from that perspective, uh, I've been a consultant at D&D uh, &D for 22 years, and it's been through Dalian, and they're very well aware that uh, I contract through Dalian. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you became a full-time employee, uh, actually, you know what, let's go back and um, look at it step by step through the hiring process and uh, the ethics and conflict forms that you signed. Can you, can you tell us what you signed? Uh, so 
through the public service, there's a natural progress, and, and uh, that was followed uh, to the letter as far as, you know, the, the uh, department is concerned. Uh, I did receive a letter of offer on the 19th. Sorry, I received the letter of offer on the 5th of September, and then we went back and forth a little bit, and I signed it on uh, shortly after that and with a start date of the 19th of September. And so within that offer is obviously the level that I went in at, which was an IT3, um, which everybody can look at and see what that level is. And, um, and also, you know, obviously a bunch of background information on the whole aspect of DOADs and codes of ethic and, and, uh, and, and the rest of it. So yes. yes. So you did sign a conflict of interest. Um, I don't think, no, I didn't sign a conflict. I signed the offer, but within the offer, they describe multiple paragraphs and, and one of them has to do with, uh, uh conflict. Yeah. Okay, so Dalian signed a contract with D&D after you became an employee again in the fall of 2021. Um, this is obviously a, a conflict of interest. Why did you not feel you were in conflict? Sure. So at that time, I had my hands off the wheel of Dalian even before the 19th of September. And so that's why I provided, you know, my signature to the staff. So if there was something going on that I would be, you know, not even aware of it. So, and in all honesty, I was not even aware that this, this uh, smaller contract had even come through uh, until I started getting re read into this file for, for our meetings. Can you, you said that there were a lot of paragraphs in your contract um, yeah. dealing with conflict of interest. Can you just uh, explain a little bit more about that? Um, so, so not like there wasn't multiple paragraphs dealing with conflict. It was it was multiple paragraphs just describing, you know, our relationship or my relationship with D and D as it relates to the Pipsy Union, as it relates to you know healthcare, or as it relates to a bunch of different things that you would normally have on an offer. But there was one paragraph in there uh, for sure on conflict. Yeah. Okay. Are you satisfied with your work on ArriveCan? Do you feel that Canadians got good value for men money there? Oh, that's a great question. I'm, as a as a certified, you know, uh, high tech, uh, you know, consult, not only a consultant but you know, a security specialist, certified in many different areas um, from IT. Uh, from an IT perspective, purely, um, there, I believe that the the aspect of, of putting all of that together, getting the coding done, getting it on an AWS landing spot, getting it onto um, you know all of the cybersecurity, all of the other healthcare PII information that needed to be adjudicated and, and, and coded into the application, you know, it, is it fair value? I would have probably booked it in at about 25 to 30 million with uh, probably a 10 or 15% contingency, which is around the number that it would come in at, at around 40 or 45 million. Have you ever belonged years. to a political party? Uh, yes. yes. Which one? Uh, I have... Two, actually. Uh, I've been a, a basically a, a PC supporter for uh, a long, long time. Um, but during the election period of 2021, I, I did move over to the PPC party and then moved back to the PC party after that. Oh. Um, Very good. That is your time, Ms. Yip. Oh, oh. oh just when it was getting... <laughs> okay. Next, we have Madame Degagné. Merci, Monsieur le Président. J'aimerais continuer sur... Thank you, Chair. I'd like to continue with what I was uh, asking about earlier. Perhaps I could assist you, uh, given that you didn't remember exactly how much you uh, pocketed with ArriveCan. Perhaps that money was uh, deposited in uh, tax haven accounts. According to what the press has found, you opened accounts in your name in tax havens on two occasions since 2011. How much money did you put in to uh, tax havens, Mr. Yeo? Yep. No, I, I, first of all, the La Press, um, you know, they came out with their uh, their fake news on on uh, me being an employer an employer of the of the government for decades. So, I mean, you got to take that for what it's worth. But um, yeah, in reference to that, you know, I, it, this goes back to my Afghanistan days. I'll be honest with you. 2008, 2009, 2010, before I went to Afghanistan, I was traveling all over the world and, and, and basically going to NATO planning meetings, going to NATO operational planning meetings. Um, on n'ouvre pas des comptes de banque dans les endroits où on voyage. You don't, we don't open bank accounts in places we're traveling through. Even if you travel for diplomatic purposes, you don't normally open bank accounts when you travel. 
Yeah, but I was a consultant back then, but it, you know, I, it gave me an awareness of international, I'm an entrepreneur first, right? I'm an entrepreneur first, I'm a soldier second, and I own Dali in third. Pouvez-vous répondre, s'il vous plaît, know. combien d'argent a été placé? Could you answer the question, how much money was it declared, was to, it was invested where it was declared to be a tax haven? Zero. You opened accounts in places where they put no money in? Why did you open the accounts? So I was getting to that. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, I am very interested in international business, you know. And so, you know, when I went, came back from Afghanistan, I looked into trying to understand how to do international business. And that's what led me to figuring out how to do an, an EIBC and figuring out how to do international bank accounts and things like that. It, it was just purely an exercise on, you know, my, my own, you know, entrepreneurship and trying to figure out stuff. Um, but yeah, no, there's uh, no, no smoking gun there. There's nothing down there. Votre réponse est hallucinante, M. Yeo. Pour faire... Your answer is unbelievable because to be an entrepreneur, you open bank accounts in tax havens. It's just un unbelievable. Next question. Let's continue with your affiliation with the uh, People's uh, PPC of, uh, of Mr. Bernier. You ran for them? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Et uh, connaissez-vous? And what's your connection with Mr. Bernier? Do, have, did you know him for a long time? No, 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 no. I obviously being with the PP or the PC party and him obviously going after the leadership during uh, the Andrew uh, Shear days. Um, that's that's my awareness of him, but I hadn't I hadn't met him before, uh, to be honest with you. Vous êtes présenté pour le Parti populaire sans. You ran for the People's Party of Canada without knowing the person who was recruiting for the People's Party. Uh, say again. You ran for the People's Party of Canada without knowing the key person who was recruiting candidates for that party? No, of course pas I knew Bernier. Yeah, I, you didn't know Mr. Bernier? Yeah, you know, as, as, a, uh, as, as a leader that was trying to be a part of the leadership... You never met Mr. Bernier personally? You never personally met Mr. Bernier? It, 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 it uh, sounds like no, but... but the, the, the question is, have you ever met... Mr. Did you meet Mr. Bernier? Oh, yes, absolutely, on a couple there. of occasions. Et voilà. For sure. I, I, I will... <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I will. I'm going to pocket all this for relevance at a future committee meeting when uh, when I'm being raised about relevance. But anyway, for now, turn that to Mr. Dejerly, and of course, my belief that members have wide latitude to ask questions. Uh, this will be Exhibit A. Uh, Mr. Dejerly, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'll just follow up on that last question, and then I'll go to another question if I have enough time. But in relation to your political affiliation, you said you're an active member of the Conservative Party today. Uh, correct. Yeah. And do you make fiscal donation to the Conservative Party? Uh, I have, yeah, since uh, since 2020, yeah. Have you ever uh, met with or lobbied on behalf of your company with any members of the Conservative Party? Absolutely not. Have you ever registered in the lobbyist registry? Uh, no, definitely not. You've never registered in the lobbyist registry? No. Have you no, ever I've spoken never been... about your company Sorry? to a government official? No, definitely not. Yeah, okay, I mean... well, moving, well, moving on then. Sorry? In terms of my previous line of questioning on your knowledge about the execution of contracts and subcontracting sub and uh, task authorizations, uh, we, it's, it's clear what was made in testimony in, pro, uh, in prior committees that in relation to Butler, it's very clear from their testimony that they did not provide consent, written consent, of their knowledge that you had executed a contract in their name, a subcontract, without their knowledge. Is that true? Yeah. As far as we're aware, when it comes to Botler, uh, they had a task authorization. We had a task authorization come from CBSA uh, that was going to GC Strategies. That's our relationship with, that's where it stops, is with GC Strategies. They hired Botler as a sub subcontractor underneath them. So our relationship was really with GC Strategies and, and Bottler's relationship was with, with uh, GC Strategies. Um, we didn't have a direct relationship with Bottler. And so you feel as though that your relationship with GC Strategies in this case was more, was your level of accountability to the TATH authorization and not to the other subcontractors of GC Strategies. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, in normal circumstance, you know, the, the prime contractor and the subcontractor have the relationship. If there's other things happening below that, then we have no influence on that. And considering you're engaged in the same project, it seems unbecoming that you did not have knowledge that GC Strategies had this sophisticated 
layer of task, Oscar, task authorizations uh, that hid the actual work that these subcontra subcontractors were doing, including your company. And I'll ask one more time, what does your company do? What did you do absent of hire other subcontractors? Yeah, it, it's a normal course of action for general contractors. You can find that in any, any No, industry no, what do you do other than that? Other than that, hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to get to that. Um, you know, when it comes to what we do, and this was asked to me in, in Go, OGO as well. And so- Yeah, it's I'm, still I'm confusing. Sure that that's, yeah, well, it, it's, it happens with every company. No, this happens country. with your company. I'm yes, asking about your company, sir. Okay, what fine, does your company done. actually do? Yeah. Mr. Jiao, I'm, I'm giving the floor to, to Mr. Yao for, for an answer, but your time is up, yeah. so please don't interrupt sure. him. Mr. Yao, I'll, I'll allow, allow you to answer them. Moving on to the next person. Yeah, every, every general contractor with the government, when it comes to TBIPS contracts, PS Online, TSPS, it doesn't matter. You know, we are the general contractor and the prime contractor for the government. We hire subcontractors to do the work. So what we do is contract management, not the actual work. Th thank you very much. Uh, turning now to Mr. Genuis, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Yao, it's good to see you again. You testified uh, before Parliament uh, on October the 31st of last year. I did at the time ask you, what would you say you do here? Uh, and this was uh, one answer you gave in the course of that round. You said, I am an executive on the board of directors for Dalian, and I maintain all of the governance as it relates to the PSAB. Uh, Mr. Yao, was that the truth as of October 31st of 2023? So, Mr. Chair, um, just a correction. It's Mr. Yo. Okay, uh, not yell. <laughs> how, so. about, how about just an answer? <laughs> but then uh, I will answer you for sure. Um, but you know, it ends up that we were in that that time frame of dealing with lawyers, and I had been, you know, directing sir, at a director. Sir, level sir, 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 sir. Uh, October the thirty first, you were before this committee. Yeah. You answered my question in a particular way. Was what you said to the, to the uh, committee then assembled on October the 31st, was it the truth? So at that time, there was no divesture because we were working on it. And were you, quote, a... on the, uh, were you, quote, an executive on the board of directors for Dalian? Were you the one who, quote, maintained all of the governance on October the 31st? Was that true? Yes or no? Sure. Yes. It was true. Uh, well, that's, what, that's the answer you're looking for, so I'm going to give it to you. No, sir, I'm looking for right. the true answer. <laughs> so, the true answer uh, is Just as we I was on October flux. the 31st. We were in flux during that time period in order to, obviously, we had 60 days to get everything done, and we did that with Dalian and got our nondisclosure in and our no access okay, in. Okay, sir, sir, sir period, you're, you're, so. you're, not, you're not in flux. You either, you either were on the board of directors or you weren't on the board of directors, Right. You know, a, 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 a person is either is either pregnant or not. They're either on the board of directors or they're right. not on the board of directors. They're not half pregnant well, and they're not half on the board of directors. You have said you that, that uh, shamefully the media have claimed that you were that you were on the board of directors and a government employee at the same time without asking you. Well, maybe they didn't need to ask you because they foolishly assumed that what you told Parliament on October the 31st was true. Now, sir, your LinkedIn account. Your LinkedIn account says that you were a business owner at Dalian Enterprises from 2001 until present, and you were employed by the Department of National Defense continuously from 1987 until present. So uh, again, uh, to, to, to your truthfulness or not, was your, was your LinkedIn account accurate? In, in description of those timelines? Well, if, if you look at LinkedIn, uh, it is a non-authoritative non source, first of all. It's LinkedIn. It's a web page, all right? Second yeah. Of all, yeah who, 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 why it, would we believe what's on the Internet, it, sir? It it's it's say, your own LinkedIn profile, sir. The why, why would we expect you know that you would put accurate information on your own LinkedIn page? <laughs> Outrageous. All right, just... You know, just, so, so, just, so, Chair, I'm, I'm okay. Mr. Just, just, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd like to answer that question if I could. Oh, well, I'm going to turn it over I, to, to Mr. Janus. It is his round of questioning. I'll just ask you to... Um, we can all hear you quite clearly, so if you could just keep that in I'm mind, glad. Mr. Janus. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I am, yes. I am getting a little bit excited here yes. because... Uh, 
Mr. Mr. Yao, uh, you Yo, have hey, you Yo. have uh, Yo. Mr. Yo, whatever your name Mr. is, sir. Yo, man. Uh, all right, you, all right, hold on, Mr. Genuous. I, I would ask. <laughs> names are important. Um, okay, we all make mistakes, but if you could conduct yourselves in a way that shows our witness respect, okay, I'd it's Genus, it. by the way, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yes, and it's William's uh, son. I realize. If, if we're that, insisting, so. all right, uh, you have a minute and a half left, Mr. Genuous. Okay. Uh, 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 sir, uh, you, you have, you have uh, on your LinkedIn profile uh, a claim that you were simultaneously working for the government and uh, leading Dalian. You told this committee on October the 31st, pardon me, not this committee, but you told that committee on October 31st that you were uh, working, uh, you were on the board of directors for Dalian. You were at the time employed by the government. Um, and, 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 and you have subsequently said, oh, no, 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 I, I, uh, there, was, there was some flux going on. But you clearly were in a conflict of interest, weren't you, sir? You were clearly doing both at the same time. And now you're trying to weasel your way out of it after the fact. But you were clearly in a conflict of interest, were you not? So, okay, so I, I need to answer the LinkedIn side of it first. First of all, it's a non-authoritative source, and it's on the Internet. It's your it profile. Say, it, did say, it did say 1987. Did you write it? It did not describe all of my service that I have done. I have done 14 years in the reg force, 10 years in the reserves, 20 years as a contractor. I've had 36 years in the department. Did, did you subcontract the writing of your LinkedIn profile, sir? Uh, probably um, could have or should have. Uh, you have time for So I needed question. to answer your question. You, you asked me a question, and I'm trying to answer it, OK? Um, the department has, has deemed. Were, were, were you not in a conflict not, of interest, in, no. being on the board of directors of Dalian, no. At the same time as you were an employee of a department that was giving contracts to a company that you, according to your testimony before Parliament, okay. were on the board of directors of. Thank you, Mr. Genius. That is your time. Is I will allow for an answer, please. Yes, I, I will allow you to answer, Mr. Genius. Your time is expired. You have the floor, Thanks, sir. Mr. Chair. Yep. Um, so um, my understanding is that D&D &D has made a statement that there was no conflict of interest. Period. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turning now to Ms. Well, that puts it to rest then. Uh, turning now to Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Yo, uh, getting back to your aborted political career, where you were a candidate for the PPC, um, do you not, a party that was against vaccine mandates, do you not see any hypocrisy in working on an Arrive Can app that was designed to track people's vaccine records? And when you actually didn't believe in the vaccine mandates in the first place and were running for a party, you know, that actually took that position? Yeah, there, there's definitely a why as to why. And thank you for the question. Uh, there was a why as to why I was trying to become a member of parliament, much like you folks uh, around the table today. And, and I wish somebody would ask me about that at some point during this time period, uh, because it's a much different answer than you think. Um, second of all, you know, when it comes to vaccine mandates, um, I'm buried two gates deep at D&D. And then at nights and weekends, I'm doing work with the PPC uh, for the election. And so, you know, from, from my side of it, um, I had no, you know, visibility into uh, a low-level contract that was with a staff augmentation contract with CBSA and the work that was going on, you know, for that, the Arrive Can. We were doing a much more work than, than just Arrive Can, and, and so I had no visibility at the time. So I just want you to go back again because I'm a bit confused. Are you saying, I think a previous answer was that Dalian and you personally actually did no actual work on the Arrive Can app. You subcontracted it all. Is that correct? You didn't actually do any actual work on well, that? I mean, like we're, we're, we're prime contractors on a staff augmentation contract that staffs, you know, subject matter experts into CBSA to actually perform the work like to code the application and project management and security and everything else. Um, so, so saying we don't do any work is a little um, uh, not true, but, the, but at the end of the day, you know, we do subcontract out that work to subject matter experts that do eventually make their way into CVSA to actually perform the work. Yes. So you got 18.2% commission rate on the 4.9 million arrive can contract. Is that correct? That's about $89,000 in commission. That's, that's what my uh, staff has told me, is 18.2, yeah. So how much was your overhead, and uh, how much was the remaining profit? I'd have to go and, and ask our CFO to, uh, to try and figure that out, but we have 
you know, my office in 222 Somerset, uh, we have uh, employees, commissions, everything else like that. So uh, I'm not sure what the exact number is, to be honest but, with you. But most of the work is subcontracted out to others, that's correct? Absolutely. Yeah, like it's sub, in some cases, uh, it's our own, you know, uh, consulting um, bench that goes out to do this. And in some cases, uh, you know, we did we did some work with GC. So. Now, if you're the majority shareholder in the company, what percentage of the net profit do you get? Well, that's that's again, that's a question of you know how many ex how much expenses are within the company. But um, you know, in normal shareholder perspective, if you are a majority shareholder and you have minority shareholders, at the end of the year, everybody's T five out as far as dividends is concerned. If we have a profit. So going back to when you formed your company in two thousand and one or two thousand and two, basically Dalian was formed to go after indigenous contracts. Uh, yeah, absolutely, because of my background and heritage. Yeah. Right. So then if you subcontract everything else out to other companies, uh, they don't have to be Indigenous service providers? No, not necessarily. I mean, you know, I helped Alan Frost with a number of other companies uh, start the uh, PSAB. He had already got it going, but we had, uh, you know, helped him formulate uh, some of the policies back then. And, uh, and it was basically for entrepreneurs that needed to have access to government contracts. Uh, so from that perspective, um, it was all about having ownership in the company and having the ability to grow the company through government contracts and then potentially either start another company or potentially hire employees and keep growing your own business. It was, uh, it's a very good policy. Okay, now in your uh, testament, testimony, um, Mr. Yu, you mentioned that you provided your signature to your staff to use when needed. Um, do you think that was appropriate under the circumstances, looking back on it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I was divesting myself from the company. I was, had no hands on the on the business after the 19th of September and actually prior to that. And uh, and they still need to get stuff signed. So um, you see that all the time in big corporations, you know, where uh, there's signatures provided. I think a person's signature indicates that you're personally tied into that contract or that deal. I, I think people don't look at a signature thinking, well, that's not really Mr. Yo. That's just, you know, just somebody else that is signing for Mr. Yo. I think they would probably think that you were overseeing it or responsible and to stand I'll behind your signature. Yeah. Yeah, uh, ultimately, you know, I own the company and I'm responsible, right? And I've taken that hit and I'm no longer with D&D &D, and my company's been terminated as far as all contracts are concerned. So I'm taking the direct hit on this. And but what I can tell you is that this is this does happen. Yeah. And thank you. That is the time. Uh, beginning our, our third round with Mr. Nader, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Yo, for uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to clarify a, a few things. Um, can you confirm that you resigned from the public service on March fifth, twenty twenty four? Is that correct? March the fifth, twenty twenty four. That is correct. Yep. Now, now you'd say that D and D had made a statement that there was no conflict of interest. Um, was that made directly to you, or who made the? No. Con no, it was out. On, it was out in the media outlets. Yeah. Did you ever receive a report from D and D related to the conflict of interest? Uh, no, there was. It was an alleged conflict that somebody put up, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, and, and, and what I've heard in the papers, and, and I know in my own heart, um, there was no conflict. So you never received a report on March third um, of a conflict of interest report from the Department of National Defense. I did not. No. Okay. We will call, follow up on that another time. Um, you mentioned that you had been a consultant for a number of years um, with the Department of National Defense. Um, I think often we, we see examples of consultants who work within the department almost uh, parallel to or often uh, in conjunction and uh, integrated with um, public servants. Um, did you ever personally have such a relationship at D&D &D in which you – uh, worked at uh, D&D HQ or worked closely with uh, full-time uh, indeterminate public servants during your time as a consultant? Well, the, the way the consultant uh, aspect works for most of the departments is that uh, absolutely you are the subject matter expert layer within the directorate and you have absolutely public servants that manage you on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So the interactions there, yeah, absolutely. So very similar to an employment situation, although you would be on a contract rather than uh, an employee of His Majesty's Public Service. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd go with the employment side of it. You're there as a contractor, right? So um, through TBIPS, through SPIPS, through PS Online, or one of those other uh, staff augmentation contracts. Um, and then that, there's a pretty clear line. You have zero uh, ability to do, sign off or do anything as a consultant, right? So, And, and during that period, uh, were you physically working at D&D HQ? Uh, not at HQ, no. No, I, I worked for uh, ADM Matt, uh, which is actually under uh, um, uh, DGLEPM, under the Army side of it. But you did work at a government office? Yeah, okay. uh, well, I was a part of the whole directorate for 22 years, yeah. Okay, but at, at a government office, okay. When was the first time you cashed, uh, cashed a check or e-transfer um, for your Arrive Can app work? When was the first time you received payment? You mentioned $4.9 million over three years. What was the yeah. first, the date of the first payment receipt? Are you, like, are you talking about a like commission or something like that? No, the first payment from the government for your work on Arrive Can. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's there. I'd have to check with our CFO shop. I'm, I don't have that detail on me. Yeah. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate getting that information on the first date they received, as well as the last date. Are you able to tell us approximately when that last um, payment came through? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, our CFO shop would have all of that detail, and we would provide that to you on a timely basis for okay. sure. I, I would appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Chair. I, mean, I, was, I was thanking the witness. I just acknowledging his, his agreement. So you've got to... 90 seconds to go. Sorry, Mr. Nader. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Um, you'd mentioned I'm, you'd mentioned in your opening statements um, how you were either putting your interest in Dalian into a blind trust or you had already put them into a blind trust when you joined the public service. Can you clarify what you meant by a blind trust? Oh, sure. So you, when you do a divestiture, there's lawyers involved and you have to divest your shares. You have to put them in uh, to a trustee. And, and there's a lot of documentation back and forth in order to facilitate that. And uh, and we did start that uh, right away. Uh, my meetings with my lawyers and things like that happened in November uh, all the way through, uh, you know, into January. And, and we put the non-disclosure, non-access in with Dalian at the same time. And, uh, and eventually, we did put in all of our documents with D&D. &D. Um, but um, could, in hindsight, I'll be honest with you, in hindsight, uh, knowing what I know now and, and the whole situation that, uh, that we've run up against here, um, there's a, a direct response from me that uh, I should have put all of that in, you know, even previous to signing the offer. And I should have done all of that prior to even looking at the offer from the government. So uh, that one's on me, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, all of the information to get well, to where it is. I'm going to push you a little bit on this. Um, you know, sure. when, when we hear the term of blind trust, I mean, it, it's tough to see how a blind trust would work when you were the founder and, and, and majority shareholder of a corporation uh, named Dalian, which, you know, you can't all of a sudden forget you own, whether it's uh, visible in a blind trust or not. But you also use the term divesting your, your interests in it. So I'm not entirely clear which one you were trying to do were you trying to put uh your your corporation to blind trust which again i'm not sure how uh how arm's length that could be or were you divesting yourself of your corporation at that time we know now you're back i guess back in full swing uh, with the company but what was actually your intent at the time was it to have it in an arm's length uh, untouchable uh, entity of a blind trust or were you divesting were you selling off your shares were you divesting yourself um, of, of your corporation at the time it's not clear what you were doing while you were acting as a member of the Public Service of Canada. Thank sure, you, Mr. Nader. Sure, that is yeah, your time. It, it, I will so, certainly allow for a reply. Yes, Mr. Yeo. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, it was not a divesture, but a, a blind trust. And, and I did, uh, you know, acquire a trustee that I trusted to, to hold my shares. And, uh, and that's the way, that's the course of action that we took. So if I mentioned divesture, I, uh, that's not the case. Thank you. That is the time. Uh, turning out to Ms. Shanahan, you have the floor for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Chair. And um, uh, Mr. Yo, I think you've, you've managed to do something that um, that actually should happen here at Public Accounts, which the, is to have all members equally um, uh, questioning uh, what it is that uh, that we're hearing and and wanting to get to the truth of, um, of uh, the matter for the sake of 
of, um, frankly, uh, for the public trust. And, uh, and that's where uh, I, for one, find your story has a number of holes in it, although it, it, um, it does come together in one way. You mentioned early on that uh, you met a gentleman, Terry Matthews. Who was that? Uh, he's a business owner in Canada and a, a billionaire, actually. So. Okay. So someone who knows how to make money, because you mentioned that you're not really in it for the money, but you met with someone who knows how to make money. And he said you should get in on, how did you put it, indigenous, indigenous, the indigenous angle? That he became, you know, indigenous procurement that he became aware of, yeah. That he became aware of. So he put you on to yeah. something. And, and uh, indeed, that's what uh, business people do. Now, you ha were not in business at the time, as you said. You had uh, no experience with, with uh, uh, technical work, coding. Um, what was your background? You were a reservist with the, with uh, the, the armed forces. Well, I mean, if you, you predate my experience, I, I went through for uh, computer science and I've been involved with computers my whole life. Uh, but certainly, you know, the aspect of my military career and my reserve career uh, and then eventually getting into back into my high tech world after all of that uh, experience uh, was the direction that I took. So, so was, was your intention then to start up a technical services country where, uh, a company where you yourself as an indigenous person, as you have identified yourself to us, would then yep. be providing services to uh, the government, who was at the time, uh, and this has covered, of course, a number of, of uh, governments uh, trying to promote uh, Indigenous uh, businesses. Yeah, in, in actual fact, the company started out as a har hardware and software company. We didn't really get into professional services until 2007, 2008. Uh, so our initial, or my was initial it your intention on... then, when you did get into professional services, to hire Indigenous employees? Absolutely. Can you say? So, can you say that you have uh, used the, your access to Indigenous uh, contracts to hire Indigenous employees? Absolutely, and we did have Indigenous employees in the in the shop. Yeah. All right. Well, at least uh, at least that. Now, going back to, uh, but but somehow it didn't work out. You had high points and low points. You weren't making money. Uh, at some point, uh, you decided to um, get yourself uh, hired again with DND. You, you entered into a, a, a contract of service. Uh, referring uh, to your uh, contract, uh, there were a number of paragraphs there, actually, that refer to the uh, Code of Ethics for the Public Sector and uh, also to the Conflict of Interest Code. Uh, in uh, one such paragraph, there's actually a form uh, called the Confidential Report, Form DND 2839, which talks specifically about conflict of interest. This is in your contract that you yourself signed. Are, uh, do you recall this form yes. that you would have signed? So it yes. does speak specifically to conflict of interest, which is uh, not something that Correct. you have been forthcoming about uh, here in earlier uh, testimony. And um, you seem to be an equal opportunity uh, conflict of interest, um, uh, how shall we say, operator, because it goes on to talk about political activities where uh, federal public service uh, employees uh, have a right to engage in political activities while maintaining the principle of political impartiality in the public service. And uh, that there are um, there's information uh, to that regard. Is that something that you also recall uh, signing? Uh, it's definitely in the offer, but the uh, political side of it was back in 21. All right. And then going back to when you did decide to become a member of Parliament, I'd like to hear why you decided that, because at the time you were uh, uh, operating uh, Dalian and that you had uh, contracts with DND so, uh, that were involved in the Arrive Can. And as other colleagues have pointed out, hard to believe that you did not know that Dalian was working on Arrive Can. So uh, why yeah. did you be decide to become a member of Parliament to run as a candidate? So, it, you know, in, in, in true form, yeah, as my Indigenous heritage, you know, side of it, my great-grandfather signed the treaties in 1923 in November. In uh, the spring of 2024, uh, the Colonials came back through and enfranchised my whole entire family. They enfranchised hundreds of people, and they enfranchised thousands of people. So you ran for the People's people. Party of Canada uh, uh, to, uh, in recognition of your Indigenous ancestry. Uh, is that I, correct? I'm, I'm definitely, definitely getting to my why for sure, and that is that you know my, my entire family has been enfranchised, and I am caught up in the second-gen cutoff rule. 
this is uh, a, a politically, uh, politically genocidal uh, article out of uh, Bill C-31 uh, that still is in the Indian Act today. And my entire family is caught up in it. And hundreds of thousands of Canadians are caught up in it. So my why as to why I wanted to get back in as a member of Parliament was to actually create a private member's bill that would allow that part of the Act, the Indian Act, to be solved once and for all, which would not only help me, but help hundreds of thousands of Canadians. Thank you. That is your time, Ms. Shanahan. Maintenant, c'est Madame Sinclair de Gagnon, encore pour deux minutes trente secondes, s'il vous plaît. Monsieur Yo. Monsieur Yo. You declared previously, and you've just done it again today, that you placed your company uh, into a trust so that you would have, uh, it would be a blind trust. Did you inform your team? and the people that support you of this process? Uh, the, team at, the team at Dalian were definitely aware that we were going through this process, yes. Mais donc, comprennent-ils qu'à poser une signature... Do they understand that uh, placing a signature is the same as placing approval? So by placing your signature, it was your responsibility and you no longer had a right if you were no longer supposed to be intervening in Dalian's business, you were not supposed to be signing that's a that's very basic who placed your signature there without you knowing about it um it, it would have been you know my staff that i directed uh, so this is definitely on me uh, i would have directed my staff i did direct my staff to you know while while i was in this um uh area of, um, uh, of, of being able to work with the department and also you know uh put everything into a blind trust that I, I gave them the authority to go ahead okay. and make sure, tout and I trusted them. So. Tout à l'heure, vous avez dit que euh, Dalia... You just said that Dalia only had two employees, you and your partner. So who's the staff? Yeah, so, so that's kind of where, you know, there's a, a misinterpretation of that. Uh, we So we have two people on staff as far as our full-time employment is concerned, but we have a shared services model with Karatix that allows us to work with, you know, CFO... HR, um, operations, etc. Okay. It's been Donc like c'est quelqu'un chez Coradix qui utilisait votre. So someone from Coradix used your signature without your consent, whereas you had requested to be in a blind trust. Who placed the signature in your stead without your consent? No, it was one of my members of staff that I I gave the authority to use my signature. D'accord, mais vous venez de répondre que c'est quelqu'un. But you've just said it was someone from Coradix. If your company, if Dalian is you and your partner. Was it your partner who then placed your signature without your consent? Why didn't he sign if he's also an owner? So, so he's not an owner. He is a member of my staff, and I gave him the authority to use my signature while I was at D&D. Donc, vous êtes l'unique propriétaire de Dalian. So you're the sole owner of Dalian, nobody else? Have I understood you correctly? There is no partner? Well, I have Karatix as a partner, yes, as a minority shareholder, yeah. D'accord. Mais si... Very well. Could you give me the name of the individual who placed your signature and who therefore did not inform you that he was signing contracts in your stead? So I gave them the authority to use my signature. C'est qui? Signature. C'est, c'est qui? So Je demande un... I'm asking you for a name. Who? Yeah, yeah. So a, a member of my staff <laughs> gave that uh, gave, that I gave my authority to, and his name is Kyle Dixon. Like I'm, okay. I'm at a point right now where you have to understand that I am trying to help you guys get where you need to go and give you the answers that you need. If you want people's names in my staff, I'll give you all of the names in my Donc, staff. Et voilà. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Desjardins. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. At the very beginning, Mr. Yo, you mentioned, quote, you were hired on September 29th, 2023. So why did Corporations Canada have you listed as a director until March 2024? So uh, it was 19 September. So the 19th of September 2023 is when I started with uh, with my employment with the public service. Um, and, and as far as, you know, Contracts Canada getting their updates, like I said, my lawyers were putting all of the documents and everything together and staffing that through for me. And um, that's the date that they, I guess, they... they uh, they have on record. So when did you first become interested in working in the public service? 
when did I first become interested? After I, your incorporation of your company, sorry. After the incorporation. So I've really been, you know, working with the department for 36 years. It was just recently that I decided because I've got, you know, five, six years, maybe seven years left of, of working, um, that I would actually look to go back and, and provide more value to the department by driving some of their large uh, projects. So, so in that um, time, was, did you disclose a potential conflict of interest? There, so as a contractor, uh, I've been working with the department for 22 years. So, you know, having the discussions about me moving over to the public service, you know, is, uh, is has been very recent because I just signed on on the 19th of, uh, of September. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. So from September to around. March, the time between those two dates, the time you left Dalian, the time you were a public servant, at any moment in there, did you declare a potential conflict of interest? To the department? To the department. Or to the department. So we were in the process of doing that over the fall and into January and getting all the documents and paperwork together to um, to put it, everything into a blind trust and that sort of stuff. And it's it's on me because we probably should have done that way before the 19th of September, and, and we didn't. And, so you're and so aware I, that I'm, there is a conflict, which is no, why you no, undertook that work. But the D&D has come back out and said there was no conflict because of the... I don't know why they, you know, the whole idea of, of the conflict is a little bit nebulous to begin with because of my position in D&D &D and the, the documents I put together for Dalian to, to uh, put in a no access and no visibility into what they were doing since the so 19th. on that so, blind trust, who's the trustee? Kyle Dixon. And how do you know them? He's a member of my staff and he's been a, a stalwart worker of mine for a long time. And at any point between your discussions of the declaration of conflict and this employee you have, was the conversation of the paperwork that never got done, um, at what point did he bring that up as a potential issue? So the paperwork did get done. Um, it just could have been on a more timely basis, like prior to me joining on the 19th. Uh, but uh, if you could repeat your question, I'll answer it. Do you know, uh, I'll ask it in a different way if I can, Mr. Chair. Did you know there was a potential conflict before your trustee or did before your trustee made you aware of that or did you ask your employee to be your trustee in your knowledge that there may be a potential conflict no i didn't ask my employee about it um so hmm, i gotta make sure i get that right so the whole idea of, of putting in the appropriate documentation and uh and putting things into a blind trust happened over all the fall and into the into the early part of 2024 but i'm trying um, to understand I why asked, you didn't make that clear before Sorry, clear in what way? Okay, the, the very start of, the, of today's discussion, one of my conservative colleagues made a question to you about a potential conflict here, and you flat out said there was no potential conflict. And now you're saying that you obviously knew of the potential conflict and filed paperwork to that degree. No, we, we didn't expect a conflict to happen at all because of the level of, of, uh, of, of position that I went in with D&D. &D. It's a very low-level position. And so you know, there was no conflict uh, awareness at all. We were just putting in the safeguards to make sure that if there ever was in the future, they'd be in place. Thank is you. that your perspective? Thank you very much. I'm Sorry, that is your time, you. Mr. Digit, but you'll get another round. Uh, turning now to Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett, you have the floor for five minutes. Do you have any companies or interests in companies outside of Canada? No, sir. No offshore holdings? No. Are any of your former colleagues at D and D double dipping? I'm not sure what I. I don't know if I know what that means, but I am not aware oh. of any double dipping going it, on. It, it's what you do. It's working for the federal government as a public servant, but also um, as a contractor uh, concurrently. Well, I would assume that there are lots of people in the public service that have companies outside of the public service, yes. That, that do but work, for, that do work for the government of Canada? You think that that's quite common? I think it's fairly common, yes. Uh, and, and what do you base that on? Just your personal experience or conversations with other public servants? I, I would say that it's, it's just my own, you know, my own perception. I've been around the department forever. And, you know, everybody uh, has their day-to-day -day work and... Maybe they have a, a little side gig at night doing uh, something else, you know. For the same department that they work for? Oh, probably not. No, if you're talking about that, yeah, no, no. No. Um, you talked about how you took this job to drive projects. 
Um, what did yeah. you say your position was uh, within the public service? So I am a tactical security specialist that's certified in high assurance capabilities that go into um, the Canadian Army at the very pointy end of the stick in combat vehicles, uh, on soldiers. Uh, I'm a soldier yep, myself. Uh, yep, the, not, so, the yeah. not the technology, sir. I'm, I'm asking about uh, what level you were at in uh, the public service. Oh, sorry, uh, an IT3. Okay, so... Um, so were were you draw, were you leading change as an IT three? Is that is that pretty common for IT threes to be um, to be leading departmental and organizational change? Well, I I, I, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't put it up that high. Uh, as a team lead, uh, that is the correct statement. As a team lead, as an IT three, and you're in charge of a number of projects. And in this case, from my side, it was a high assurance security okay. project. Um, so you've said that the Auditor General's uh, figure that she attributed to your companies is incorrect. Is that, that's fair? This you, is what I've been read into and my staff tells me, yeah. What you've been read, in, did you read the Auditor General's report? Absolutely. Okay. All of it. So and I've got lots of comments. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's, that's great. So by read into, you mean you read it? Yep. Okay. 100%. So, so you read it and determined that the Auditor General, who is by definition, a general with an army of auditors, that should be easy for you to understand based on your experience, that the whole army of auditors was wrong and this one-man army was right. But you've offered a, a series of, um, of assertions in, in your committee appearances that aren't true. And those have been highlighted by um, members of, uh, of other parties and, and, and my colleagues. Um, even just today, you said that you're a member of the Conservative Party. And, and that's not true. Uh, you haven't been a member of the Conservative Party since 2021. And, and, and so, uh, that's, okay, that, that's, no, that's, 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 okay, that's fine. Okay. Order, that's fine. order, that's order, fine. order. We order, know, we order. know how just to. Just one second. That, know how to, just, just one second. I, I'm going to stop the clock. A, A, that is a prop and it's not allowed. Second, that is a donor card and it's not a membership card. We all get them to try to get money. Mr. Barrett, you have a minute and a half. Um, so it's a so it's a so it's a donor card. So okay. what so so what so what you're offering is again uh, not not an honest representation of what you're doing. And I know you thought it was going to be a great gotcha moment, but it demonstrated that you're not being truthful, sir. And so so when it comes down to you not knowing the difference between being a member of a party and whether or not you've made a donation to a party. Should we really trust your assessment on whether or not the Auditor General of Canada is wrong in the amount of business that you have done with the government of Canada? Uh, I'm inclined, I'm inclined to, to trust the Auditor General, just like um, I, I know that I can trust membership services that they knew that whatever it was that you were going to hold up uh, wasn't going to be what you said it was. So, um, well, while your misrepresentations vary, uh, that, that's just another great example that um, we can't trust what you've said uh, to be true, and it gives rise to more questions than it does answers. I'll cede my time back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, turning now to Mr. Johari, you have the, well, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Johari, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, it's good to be here once again. And uh, Mr. Yo, I'd like to go back to the Arrive Can. Can you kindly tell me how did the contract for Arrive Can came to Dalian? Um, my understanding, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the question. Um, my understanding is that we never had an Arrive Can contract, but this was all through staff augmentation contracts that were competitively awarded to Dalian on behalf of CBSA. So okay. my understanding is that it was staff aug contracts, yeah. Okay, so um, the staff augmentation contract that was awarded to Dalian on CBSA, um, how, how did that come about? So again, I'm, I'm buried two gates deep at D&D, &D and, uh, and I, I don't have the exact yeah. uh, aspects of how that actually transpired, but yeah. I could ask our staff. And yeah, I, I would appreciate it if you could provide that to the committee. Sure. Uh, sure. Sir, you, you've indicated that uh, the amount of the contract was 
million. The amount of stack, uh, staff augmentation was 4.9 million over three years for 20 employees at 100 hours, and you call that a part-time, correct? Correct. Okay. So if, if my math holds, and at 1.6 divided by 20 divided by 100, you are charging about $815 an hour, whereas GC strategy for Arrive Can was charging in the 1200 plus. Can you explain why? Because if you are, can, can you tell me what is it that your team and those, that 20 man team was, uh, 20 person team was doing for CBSA? So, sure. So I'm not sure exactly of their specific tasks because of the fact that uh, this goes into uh, staff augmentation, whether it's, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the people that went into it was software development, testers, project management, technology architecture, cybersecurity. Um, so once they get over to the CBSA through the staff augmentation contract, it's really up to the technical authority to drive whatever business needs that are happening on that side. Uh, but to get to your question about um, you know, 20 people on the contract, uh, my understanding and, and what my staff has provided me is that the bill rates ranged from $540 to $1,000 per day, depending on the service. Okay, uh, what, which is pretty much aligned with what uh, um, uh, Auditor General wa was talking about as was rate, but that's very different than the rate that GC strategy wa was charging. Were you dealing directly with CBSA? Sorry, was Dalian dealing directly with CBSA was, or was through another, um, another organization or... Yep, my understanding is that Dalian ha was the prime contractor for these uh, contracts. So yes, we were dealing directly with CBSA. Yep. Okay. Can you tell me of the 20 employees that worked on that project, how many of them were Indigenous? Um, there are 20 IT professional consultants, uh, not employees, um, but I would have to check with our staff to see if any of them are actually Indigenous. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me of the projects that you have uh, work with the government of Canada, how many of them have been, whether as a subcontractor, whether as your employee, how many of them have been Indigenous? I know there's a number. I know there's a number out there. Um, um, would again, you know five, would 10, 20, 50? This is the challenge we have with Indigenous, you know, our Indigenous culture, right, is that we don't have enough trained technical people coming out of the Indigenous side of things. Uh, so how I, much I don't investment has number? your company made into training Indigenous people? Um, so from a training perspective, I would say that we have, we have had experiences with Algonquin College in the past where I have given out a, an Aboriginal Achievement Award to technical people that have passed the bar at Algonquin and have brought them in for a 12-week placement at the company. Um, and then they've either stayed or they Would it be along. fair to so, say yeah. that because of your claim of Indigenous status, you're very comfortable taking... Uh, under the procurement allocation or under set-aside contract, yet your investment, the company of Dalian, into either hiring or training and building capacity within that Indigenous group is non-existent. You know, see, the, the PSIB and the PSAB at the time is not in... They're, they're, it's, it's not in the spirit of, of, um, of, of actually you know, that aspect. It's in the spirit of trying to get access to government contracts and being able to compete against bigger companies. So absolutely, we've done, you know, what we've done in the past with Algonquin and, and tried to hire Indigenous people, which we have internal staff and also contractors. Uh, but I just don't have the current number of how many Indigenous contractors we have today. Can you kindly provide that? And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we can, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. I just wanted to appreciate that, Mr. Howard. And good. We'll, we'll look for that response as well, Mr. Yao. Uh, beginning now, our, our uh, fourth and last round, Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. So I want to pursue this line of misrepresentations, Mr. Yo. Um, I know Mr. Barrett asked you some questions and other members have asked you questions, which, in my opinion, really challenge your credibility. Now, both uh, you and the... Uh, the owner of Coradex, Mr. Wood, testified on October 31st 
2023, and both of you were quite emphatic that um, you are regularly, both businesses are regularly audited by Indigenous Services Canada with respect to the procurement strategy for Indigenous businesses, and you both have been receiving clean audits. But that was a misrepresentation. It was a really, it was a lie because Indigenous Services Canada said all they do with respect to the set-asides that both of your companies operate under from time to time is they do pre-audits. They don't do post-audits. Do you agree with that assessment from Indigenous Services Canada? I, 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 I would absolutely agree with that. Yes, right. For sure. But you didn't qualify that to the membership. You didn't qualify that to committee. Well, it's, it's your policy. I mean, like it, I, I, I understand that we go through audits, but I think that's a that's a normal course of action for ISC in its entirety. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty big deal, sir, when you lead the committee to believe that you're running a clean business, that your indigenous set asides are legitimate. They're not operating under a phantom scheme. I know you've been heavily criticized by a number of indigenous organizations that you're running this. In fact, Baller. Uh, even made the same allegation. So these are real concerns. And I think you have to be honest with committee members, sir, because although you haven't been sworn to tell the truth, there is a presumption that you will tell the truth at committee. And there are consequences when people do not tell the truth at committee. So we're going to find out ultimately by the end of this summer through Indigenous Services Canada, who's going to audit everything that you have done, as well as Corridex, hopefully for the last eight years, if not longer, with respect to all the Indigenous set-asides. Because I think Canadians deserve to know whether or not Indigenous Canadians have benefited from this particular government operation. And if they haven't, then, sir, you'll have some questions to answer. So I put that out to you, sir. Now, the other aspect that concerns me is your relationship with... Um, with the GC Strategies. Is it accurate, sir, that the one and only time that you worked with GC Strategies was on the Bottler uh, task authorization? That I would have to ask our staff. I'm not exactly sure if there was anything else uh, in, I, in relation to working with GC Strategies. So okay. I'd have to ask our staff about that. Well, let's talk about Bottler for, for a moment, please. Um, you do know that um, Christian Firth testified uh, from... Uh, GC strategies that not on one occasion but upwards to five occasions he deliberately and intentionally doctored work experience for both of the Bottler partners and he claimed it was a mistake but given my former background as a crown attorney all accused persons all criminals claim they made mistakes what in fact Mr. Firth did was commit forgery and it was a fraud on the government. And what concerns me, sir, is that the Globe recently reported that both you, your company, Dalian, and Corridex received those doctored resumes, those fraudulent forged resumes, and you, in fact, forwarded that on to the government. That, that was recent news to me and perhaps this committee because we were all led to believe that it was Christian Firth at GC who delivered that directly to the government. So it really begs the question, sir, if you've only had a limited amount of time with GC strategies, why would you accept their material at face value? Because now you're implicated as a joint venture, as a party to the offense of fraud and forgery. It's no wonder that the RCMP are currently investigating your company and that of Cordex. And notwithstanding that you haven't been contacted, certainly does not make yourself in the clear. So you talked about quality management systems in place. Why didn't the quality management system catch these fraudulent resumes? Yeah, for sure. So it's a good question. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, we're as dismayed as the rest of the committee on the findings from GC Strategies. Uh, we were definitely not aware of what was going on, you know, below our subcontractor. Uh, the, the, the contract between us and GC Strategies is exactly that. We have no reference to Bottler in, in this case and, and what information is being provided, you know, by GC Strategies to us. 
Um, there are aspects that, uh, and I will be honest with you, there's aspects of third-party verification on employment and that sort of thing, but it's not an industry standard. It's not a, a, an industry standard that, that everybody does in the entire, uh, you know, p professional services market. So, you know, what we've learned from this is that um, even though we do our due diligence on security clearances and putting the CVs together and the categories and the grids and staffing that up to CBSA, what we have learned is that we likely need to put a third party, um, you know, verification of employment in place that would allow us to smoke this kind of stuff out. And we just weren't aware of it. Thank you. That is the time. Turning Thank out you, to Mr. Chair. Chen, you have the floor. Mr. Chen for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Yo, you've had a long career. You joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1987. You became a reservist uh, in 2001 until uh, 2016. You were hired, as we've heard today, by National Defence uh, in 2023. Earlier today in your in your testimony, you said that it was fairly common, quote unquote, that many government employees have a company on the side. Um, you, you said that that was your own perception. Could you elaborate what informed your perception that many government employees run side hustle businesses on the side? <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you this, that, that, you know, Canada and our taxation system and, you know, everything being so ex expensive with inflation and everything else, whether you're a government employee or whether you're someone else not working with the government, uh, there's likely a chance that you might have something else on the side to help, you know, pay the bills and, and put groceries on your table. So, you know, my perception is uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I try and start things all the time and I'm looking for, you know, multiple sources of income. And I'm sure that, you know, many Canadians Canadians are in the same boat, whether so, they're working uh, for the uh, government or not. Uh, with all due respect, sir, I, that was not my question. You said earlier that your perception, your own perception, is that many government yeah. employees have corporations on the side. My question to you is what informed your perception that other, not yourself, but other government employees, and in fact many of them, as you stated, have corporations on the side? Well, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, again, this is my, my own perception and, and, you know, whether they have corporations or whether they have, you know, uh, things after hours, uh, it's, it's their own, it's their own business. Uh, but, you know, I can tell you that from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm out doing what I need to do for the, for the government during the day. Uh, but then I'm an entrepreneur at night and trying to do other things. So uh, I can't imagine others aren't uh, similar. You talked earlier about how you got into securing government contracts. In fact, you said you go after them. And I want to hear from you, uh, Mr. Yo, how, how easy has it been or difficult has it been uh, for you to secure government contracts? Would you consider yourself uh, successful in being able to secure government contracts for work through your company? Dalian has really been a, in my opinion anyways, Dalian has been a very uh, good success story. Um, uh, up until recently with all of this hype about uh, me being a, an employee uh, prior to uh, the ArriveCan days and, and during ArriveCan. But yeah, you know, uh, understanding how, and this is what PSAB actually does for us, is, is that it allows us to be able to be a part of the solution with the government as far as Indigenous companies are concerned and learn about how to interact with the government through contracting, through procurement, through staffing, and all of the other aspects that go along with that. So uh, absolutely, yep. You understand as an employee uh, or former employee of National Defense and as somebody who has many interactions with, uh, has had many interactions with government over the years, that public servants play a fundal, fundamental role in serving this country, that their, their conduct is uh, carefully watched, and that it's important to uphold public trust because Canadians put their faith in the government to deliver programs and services, and that includes the people that are hired within that public service to act in the most transparent, accountable, and ethical ways. Would you, would you say that it is, it, it can be seen as a perceived conflict of interest when 
you have been able to be so successful, yet I hear a very different narrative on the ground from people who are everyday Canadians unable to access government contracts, companies that are doing good work, innovative work that have told me that they're unable to even crack the door open. Do you find that there is a a perception that that there is there is something that that is uh, allowing you to have access that other people cannot and the fact that you have said today that it's common for people in working in in the public service to have corporations as as you have that the narrative that i hear from everyday people in my writing is that they can barely get home in time going through traffic, working 10 hours a day to then be able to prepare a meal for their family, that the last thing on their mind is to set up a corporation and have a side hustle where they can make more money and be able to afford the things that they need to. I, I'd like to hear your comments on that, Mr. Yo. Yeah. No, I appreciate the uh, the backdrop. Um, you know, it's been difficult. I mean, there there is no uh, easy... Uh, button when it comes to working with the government. Uh, many, many corporations die on the vine because of the fact that they're, they just can't handle the actual process um, for actually winning contracts. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you on the fact that they, um, you know, the Canadians are struggling and, and some of the people don't understand uh, how to actually process, you know, uh, successful, you know, contracting mechanisms. But um, in the end, it's very competitive. It's super competitive, and our hardware and software business has uh, shown that in the last five or six years where we have put in multiple RFPs and not won them. Uh, but, um, but certainly, you know, learning the process, uh, whether it's under PSAB or whether it's under a, a different uh, non-Indigenous non side, uh, and how to interact with the government is very long, very arduous, and, and extremely complicated. Earlier, and that, you, I'm you mentioned that, your billionaire. That, I'm afraid that is, that's the time, Mr. Chen. We've gone, we've gone well over. I know your, your side does have another spot left, and I know you have more questions. So I will move on to Madame Sikhla Dengangi. You have the floor for two and a half minutes, Ms. Sikhla Dengangi. Mr. Yeo. How long have you known or have you been working closely with Mr. Wood from Cordex? Colin was, uh, he came into Coradix a number of years ago. Um, but um, again, you know, I've, I've been working at, at D&D two gates deep for a long time and and have, uh, have not exactly a lot of interaction Mais with vous avez tout à que But you mentioned Coradix and Dalian and how they work with shared services and have been doing so for several years. So how long have Dalian and Cordix been working so closely? Oh, so, since the beginning, since the beginning. I mean, I came to them. I came to them in 2002 with my first contract. Vous ne connaissiez pas Monsieur Wood avant... Uh, and you didn't know Mr. Wood before he joined Cordix? Uh, no. no, I did not. Savez-vous que... Do you know that just before coming to Cordix, Mr. Wood worked at Veritac which on 20, 23rd of February 2009 was uh, found guilty of falsifying a supply. They were rigging a bid. Were you aware of that? Uh, so Mr. Wood would have hidden the fact that for his former company that he worked for just before Cordix was doing the same maneuvers that they're, uh, that strangely enough, Dalian and Cordex are being accused of today in terms of rigging and GC strategies in terms of uh, rigging bids. And shortly after 2015, there were other accusi accusations about Mr. Wood, and he left uh, that company and came to Cordex and has been working closely with Dalian. Do you see any link between the potential allegations of bid rigging which were revealed by the Auditor General's report and those already done by a firm regarding a firm that Mr. Wood was a sales director of at the time. Yep. No, I, I can only attest to what I know, and that is uh, I've known Colin since he came to Karatex. Uh, I was not aware of his previous employment. D'accord. Considérez-vous encore travailler? Are you still considering working with Mr. Wood now that you know that he had uh, him, or not him directly, but the company he was working for that he was sales director for was uh, found guilty of bid rigging? Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's always a conversation. It'll always be a conversation. So yes, yeah, so I'll have Donc a conversation normal with Colin. So that's to be expected for you? 
That's normal? No, it's not normal. Of course not. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Shelley, you have the floor for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I do want to return to the comments you made in relation to uh, one of my colleagues' questions on the uh, doctored resumes. And so the doctored resumes, what do you, what do you know about these, these resumes? Uh, not much, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, in the end, you know, if, if you talk about these, what happened between Bottler and GC, um, they could put anything on there as far as their experience is concerned. And when it goes, our relationship is with GC and with, uh, with the Crown, obviously, with CBSA as, uh, as, their, as our subcontractor. So how involved so, were you in the review of Bottler's resumes? M me personally, zero. I was at D&D, two gates. What about your company? Get, my company? Obviously, I mean, it was a JV, right? So we obviously had interaction with... Uh, GC strategies in, in performing the uh, task authorization requirements, yeah. And so did you, did GC strategies speak to you as to their use of the company, Butler? I'd have to check with, uh, with our staff and, and ask them that. I'm not aware of, obviously they had to have some interaction, you know, between the task authorization request and our uh, relationship with GC, uh, but I'm not aware of the details of what they discussed as far as Butler's concerned. So these forged resumes that gave preferential access and eventually the awarding of the bid is tremendously uh, disingenuous and is, yeah. is certainly defrauding uh, Canadians. And so I want you to know how serious this issue is and to understand that providing any assistance from your company to the forgery of documents is illegal. Do you understand that? Absolutely. And that's why we're just as dismayed as everybody else as to why Who's and how... We could have got this information wrong. Whose letterhead were these resumes on? Uh, so I would expect that our relationship as the prime to CBSA, we would have staffed up the package for the task authorization to them uh, as part of, of the uh, requirements package. Uh, so it would have gone on Dalian letterhead, uh, but I'm not sure exactly what the interaction or documents or letterhead was. So you're, you're misrepresenting CNS. facts, Mr. Yossi. That's, that's completely disingenuous to then say you, your company never had any access to a bottler. Your only relationship was with GC Strategies. And then you just now confirm that the resumes that were forged were in your company's letterhead? Is that true? So, so again, I Can you repeat that? Not... No, Mr. Yo. Is what you just said true? Are the forged so, resumes on your company letterhead? I can give you the process. I have never no, seen I, Mr. Yo, can you please answer yes or no to the fact you no. just submitted? Well, I, I tell you this. I understand what the process would be because I'm a, I understand task authorizations, but I have not seen any of the paperwork. None so of, you, just submitted, you just admitted that how, you've not seen the paperwork, but you just said you know that the letterhead is on Dalian or the forged documents are on Dalian letterhead. I can assume that obviously us as the prime and us giving you know CBSA this documentation as a part of the task authorization, likely it would go on Dalian letterhead. Mr. Yo, Thank this has much. been I'm extremely disappointing to see this level the, of misrepresentation. Your time, Mr. Dejarle, uh turning now to Mr. Janus. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. Yo, your company has two people. Is your partner Indigenous? He is. He is okay. Uh, you got $7.9 million uh, on uh, ArriveCan alone, uh, even though, uh, as you've testified, you didn't do any actual work on the app. Uh, how many Indigenous Canadians, besides you two, uh, benefited from that big fat check that the government wrote to Dalian for ArriveCan? So our interpretation is that it's $4.9 million. Um, but the uh, aspect in, in, of, so, you, so your interpretation is that you know better than the Auditor General? I'm just telling you the facts that from our side. Uh, whether, and, right, and we actually right, well, went out to the... I, 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 I think that's absurd, sir, but I, I want to actually focus on, on uh, the Indigenous uh, procurement component of it. Sure. How many Indigenous let, let me people just, besides I'm, you I've, and I've your partner? I've stopped the clock, Mr. Jonathan. I will just remind everyone, because there is this has come up time and time again, the, the Auditor's terms... Do, do do not allow her to go into uh, companies like the one before City Dalian. So that you sent her documents uh, from her perspective could have been irrelevant. You'll all recall that the auditor noted she came up with these numbers based on what uh, the government of Canada provided her. So just that that's just a point of clarification for the for the committee. It doesn't change any of your questions, Janice. I just wanted to I just wanted to kind of um, put that out there that this is a an ongoing debate 
about the the scope of of a ride can and i think it is an important one so um we don't know what the answer is that's why these committee meetings are are happening mr generous you have the floor for four and a half minutes uh mr yo besides the two people at your company how many indigenous people benefited from the 7.9 million dollars that the government of canada gave you for the work you did on arrive camp so in reference to the 7.9 million which is actually 4.9 our actual representation of profit in that helps not only our pay our staff but also helps with our staff augmentation with karatics as well how, I how many indigenous people so you're not answering my question you keep so, talking about your staff, so, but there's two of you. So, 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 okay, there are, there are two Indigenous people who benefited, you and your partner. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but how many other Indigenous people benefited from, uh, from this uh, particular outlay from the Government of Canada? Well, I mean, we, we do work with the Algonquin College on uh, staffing uh, bursaries and, and things like that. Uh, I do have outreach back to my own, you know, reserve in Alderville. Uh, but as far as, you know, uh, benefiting... What, 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 does that, what does that even mean, though? Like, like you, you, have, you have reached back, so you, you know, when you make a lot of money, you, I don't know... Uh, like, like how, how, do, how, do, how do Indigenous Canadians... The, Benefit so the, the PSAP, from you the PSAP, getting this deal. Yeah. Sure. The, the PSAB process and the PSAB policy, that's a government policy that we, we favor because it's a great policy. Um, it, it's not I'm, made I'm sure you, you think it's to, a great policy. <laughs> Sorry, it's not made to It's not made to help uh, Indigenous communities across the country. It's, it's made to help the entrepreneur that's trying to get government contracts to grow his business. So okay. you know, in that context, it's not made for helping out Indigenous communities across the country. Okay, so, so you, 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 just said, you just said that the government's Indigenous uh, procurement policy, in your view, is not made to benefit Indigenous communities across the country. It's made to benefit the particular entrepreneur. It's made to in help the entrepreneur get access to government contracting that would allow them to grow the company right. in whatever fashion they want. So your, your, your position is... The policy made you money, therefore it's achieving its objective, regardless of the impact on Indigenous communities across the country. So, you, so that could be your interpretation, but it's not the reality. The reality is... Sorry, I, I, sorry, I just, I'm just government... repeating what you just said, though. Well, no, you weren't repeating what I just said. But in, in the context of the PSIB, um, it's spread out across the entire country, and there's lots of people that are actually working within the... the framework of that no but, but, okay, us, I'm, but sir that, that actually isn't so what you it, said before but but to, to broaden this out so uh, uh, from what i understand you you've gotten your, your company has, has received um, hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts from the trudeau government since since 2015 um that is under the, the framework of a policy that i thought was intended uh to actually elevate the the conditions uh that indigenous peoples in this country are, are living in um, and you're saying, well, no, it's, it's good enough that that process made me money. That, that would seem to go against what Canadians would expect of the policy, surely. My understanding of the value that you put out was, uh, was $91 million. I've got it in front of me from 2015 until now. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can look in the PSAB and the PSIB policy and okay. nowhere okay. will it Sorry, be. Sorry, just because my time is about to run out, Chair, I'd like to move a motion that the committee write to INAN to recommend that they investigate abuses in the Indigenous procurement system. I think the need for this motion is self-evident from the testimony that we've received. In, uh, any chance you sent that motion I to I declare? did send it in advance. It's that the committee write to INAN to recommend that they investigate abuses in the Indigenous uh, procurement system. Thank you. Very good. Could you distribute that? When, when ready? Done. Perfect. Mr. Desjardins, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Just speaking to the motion, Mr. Chair, and a potential misrepresentation by Mr. Yo about PSAB contracts. As a matter of fact, 33% of all 
contracts by PSAB must be completed by Indigenous service providers, including when work is subcontracted. And so, Mr. Yo, you've spoken a great deal of your experience in working with subcontracting and your expertise of being a contractor of this great magnitude that you can solve all the government's problems with these great general contracting, but you don't actually know the policy. Just, 33%. Just a, a point of clarification. So I, I will vote. We've, we've now moved into debate on the motion. The witness is not to, de is not to enter debate on this. This is for, for members to consider the motion. So you of can course. ask rhetorical questions, but the, mem the witness will not be engaged in any of this discussion. Uh, and I course. see your hand. Is that a point of order or to, to speak? I was going to finish that. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> Which leads me to believe that including the motion made by our colleague to refer this to INAND for further investigation, I also think that uh, we should confirm by way of letter, Mr. Chair, um, to you as to the nature of the PSAB contract policy and refer that with the motion. It'll help them a great deal because they're not used to this kind of stuff, I don't think. So, but sorry, can, can you, are you proposing a suggestion to the chair or an amendment to the motion? Oh, sorry, not, not an amendment, a suggestion okay. to the chair. In okay. a, if this motion passes. Okay, let's, let's cross one sure. at a time, we'll do it but one I, time. I hear what you're saying. Ms. Shanahan. I, I would like to speak to this motion, but I'd also like to ha have just five minutes so we can discuss it. Because again, and you know, this goes to show that um, this is a committee that's working together. We find elements of this motion very interesting, but we'd like to discuss it with the members so we can come to to something pretty. Um, yeah. Um, w w w w yes. Yeah, so I will. I will. Sus I will suspend the, for yeah. for for five minutes maximum. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we're going to try to get additional resources. Mr. Chair, I'm going to have to ask you just to kind of hold firm for a for a little little, little while longer because we might uh, we might come back to you for some questions mm -hmm. for just one last member. Uh, so yes, I'll suspend for session five. back into order. Uh, Ms. Shanahan, I believe you had you were first on the speaking list uh, on the motion that is before us. It, it, uh, thank you, Chair, for giving us that um, five minutes to to speak with all colleagues. Because, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that um, the testimony that we've heard today is uh, is is leading us all in this direction to have this request for further investigation uh, by INAN. So, I I think the wording of the uh, motion is satisfactory to us, uh, but I don't know if my colleague has something that he wanted to uh, add. So, Mr. I, I have no other speakers. So, Mr. Dejale, I see your hand. Uh, just, just to Ms. Shanahan's point, and to your point, Mr. Chair, it's actually in relation to the content of the letter with, that's contained within the motion. So, I'm not sure if you want to hear my advice on that now or after the vote. But I do believe that the letter that is sent to INAN should include the PSAB policy. Sure. That is, so they understand that this is our concern, that there's a significant breach sure. of what is so the policy. Here, my preference is by coincidence, we have a subcommittee meeting on Thursday. Let's bring it up then. We can probably even maybe get some language drafted by the research before then, then we can look at it. And I will certainly incorporate uh, the views of all members, given that I hope this is going to be unanimous motion. So anything else to discuss on this? Uh, clerk, please call the vote, the roll call. Shall the motion, uh, as moved by Mr. Dennis Carey? Ms. Bradford? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Jawari? Yes. Ms. Shanahan? Yes. Ms. Yip? Yes. Uh, Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Dennis? Yes. Mr. Veerson? Yes. Madame St. Cloud de Gagny? Oui. Mr. Desjardins? Yes. 11, uh, 10 yes. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes that uh, bit of business. I'm going to go back to just finishing up with our questionnaires. Uh, Mr. Yao, you'll be, uh, I'm going to call you back up for your, for your presence. Um, Ms. Yip, you have the last round of five minutes. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. And I'll be sharing my time with Ms. Shanahan. Uh, Mr. Yo, you said repeatedly that D&D uh, &D said there was no conflict. Um, and you keep talking about this document. Can you provide a copy to the committee? So, so I, I did see in the papers uh, that D&D did make a statement uh, indicating that there was no conflict. And uh, it's a protected B document, but I have no issues with supplying you with anything. Okay. Um, 
do you think there was anything wrong with the Auditor General's report on Arrive Can? Uh, so it's a good report, uh, but they have trouble putting this together because of the exact nature of how contracting works with TBIPs and SBIPs and professional services. If they're all staff augmentation contracts. There potentially could be direct contracts with for, for Arrive Can only. Um, so they have a challenge against them to try and decipher all of this data. And so, you know, even though we inst instituted an email back to the Auditor General on the 30th of January indicating this, you know, 4.9 versus 7.9 that was attributed to ArriveCan, uh, they themselves even have uh, attributed to uh, on page 5, uh, 1.21, they've indicated that uh, CBSA has expressed concerns that 12.2 million of the 59 million estimate could be unrelated to ArriveCan. So, I mean, it's a challenging report uh, and it's a challenging effort to put it together. Okay. Um, your time in Afghanistan, how long were you there? I was there for four months. And what was your role there? I was delivering a high assurance security capability to Kandahar and to all of the forward operating bases out in Afghanistan. Uh, just, can you just tell me what that means? Um, basically, our effort was to ensure that all of the pieces and parts were in place so uh, all of our coalition members knew exactly where our friendly forces were and, and a couple of other capabilities. Uh, thank you, and uh, over to you, Mr. Shanahan. Thank you very much. Uh, so just a, a few more questions, uh, Mr. Yo, to clarify uh, who you are and your background and so on. So how long have you been a member of the Conservative Party? Well, I've been a member for my entire life. I've been always voting, you know, uh, progressive conservative. And at the same time, um, I believe that my last membership back in after my uh, my very short stint with the PPC party uh, and I came back to the party is for five years. Oh, and you did show a card at some point. Can you just show that up for the uh, no, hold that up no, to the camera? No, or that perhaps is a prop. table no, it, table no. it to Miss uh, Shanahan. Hold on, hold on, Miss Shanahan. Document? That I just that is a prop. As the clerk is reminding me, okay. and not permitted. So yeah as as a document to table it uh, with this committee You're that would be greatly send it appreciated in. because it okay. it does seem that there's some uh, uh confusion between whether it's a membership point, card point or of order uh, mr chair uh yes mr. it's Jennings. it's quite evident that uh mr yo does not have a conservative membership okay. card therefore i have no objection to tabling oh, thank you all right Excellent. You, uh, you see how well we work together, Chair. I, I, this is uh, so much appreciated. Uh, can you tell us, uh, as you are a, don uh, a donor, just uh, uh, roughly how much money have you donated to the Conservative Party? Oh, I, I'm not sure if I can disclose that, but it's uh, it's not not great numbers, that's for sure. All right. Uh, and and just for the the sake of um, of parity, have you ever been a member of the Liberal Party of Canada? I have not. Well, there you go. Thank you very much. That's it? Maybe That's this is it. in my future. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Liberal yeah. insight. Oh, I, I should ask maybe one last question. So the Not People's exactly. Party of Canada, you said you're no longer a member. So can you just, just uh, right. give us the duration there of how long you were a member of that party? Is there overlap here too? Or? Maybe, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe five months from start to finish. Because yeah. originally I was actually in line to be the PC party uh, candidate for uh, Ottawa West Nepean. So I was actually in line to be with the PC party, which I, I should have stayed with them. But uh, I moved over to the PPC party uh, after Mr. O'Toole's kind of policies came out. Well, I, 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 uh, yeah. So I think that uh, I think that concludes my questions, Chair. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Yao. You are excused. I appreciate you coming before us today. Uh, and to uh, everyone else here on committee, we'll see you Thursday. This meeting is adjourned.